Good afternoon. My name is Erwin Chemerinsky, and I'm the Dean of the Law School. We're here today for the second annual Raymond Pryke Lecture on the First Amendment. Ray Pryke is in the midst of an amazing career. He was an RAF pilot. He came to Southern California and started with now a string of newspapers that are on the label of Valley Wide Newspapers. Mr. Pryke has endowed for us the Raymond Pryke Chair in First Amendment Law the first chair of this sort at a UC law school, and a relatively small number of chairs in First Amendment law at any law school in the country. I'm deeply honored to have been chosen to be the first occupant of the Ray Pryke Chair in First Amendment law. It means that for better or worse, anything I do has his name attached to it. <laughs> better for me, maybe worse for him. <laughs> and we started the tradition here that when a professor gets a chair, um, there's literally a chair that goes with it, and our faculty has decided that they want to have as their chairs rocking chairs from like those in the library. So this is actually the chair that goes with being the Ray Price Professor of First Amendment Law. <laughs> Mr. Price can't be here today, but we are taping this for him. And it's a wonderful opportunity to thank him for his support of the law school the support of the First Amendment, and for creating this Ray Pryke Chair in First Amendment Law. One of the parts of the chair that is really key for us is every year we bring in a speaker now to deliver the Ray Pryke Lecture in First Amendment Law. Here at the law school, we have a committee that meets each spring to decide who should be the people who we invite to give the endowed lectures. When we said, well, what about the Ray Pryke lecture next year, one name came immediately to everybody's mind. Everyone said, if we could, let's see that, that Kelly Sager come do the Ray Pryke lecture. Um, i thrilled that Kelly Sager accepted this invitation. Kelly is the leading lawyer with regard to free speech, the First Amendment in the country. Um, I first learned of Kelly Sager in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when she was a championship debater at the University of Southern California and West Georgia College, um, I was putting together a program at Northwestern University for high school debaters, and I was asking around who were the top debaters and who would be the ones who were the best instructors. And the name I kept hearing from everybody was Kelly Sager. We called and we spoke, and though she wasn't available to teach in the program, I was so impressed and charmed by her and our paths then, several years later, crossed, and thankfully had the opportunity to often cross paths with Kelly, work with Kelly. Um, Kelly then went to the University of Utah Law School, where she was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. She went to Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, where she had a distinguished career as a litigator, and now she's a partner at Davis Wright and Tremaine. She's been practicing law for 27 years now. She's represented all of the major media companies, She's involved in virtually every high-profile trial and case you can think of. Anytime there is a First Amendment issue, it's Kelly Sager who's the one that's there arguing it, whether it's in the California Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit, or literally any other court in the country. And so when I say to you that Kelly Sager is the leading First Amendment lawyer in the country, it's not hyperbole, it's true. And the other thing that I can tell you, having known Kelly now for over 30 years, she's a truly wonderful person. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you to the second annual Raymond Pryke Lecture, Kelly Sager. Well, it's a great honor to be here, and it is a great honor and such a nice introduction from Dean Chemerinsky. Um, what, what he didn't say, even though I've been practicing law for 27 years, I started when I was five, so. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, it, it, it's quite an honor to, to be here at this law school. I've, I've followed with great interest uh, ever since I heard about the law school, and the, the kinds of programs that you guys are doing here are really outstanding. So to, to uh, actually have a chance to, to be the Raymond Pryke lecturer today, as I said, is a great honor. Um, I'm going to be talking, I guess, for about 45 minutes. I'll try to save some room for questions at the end. If you can't hear me in the back, let me know. I'm not using a mic, but I'll speak up more loudly. And uh, um, I'll, uh, as I said, uh, be interested in any questions or comments you have. If you can't wait, feel free to ask as we go along. I'm not, not uh, uh, adverse to being interrupted. 
the topic that we're going to be talking about today, misappropriation of the right of publicity, is, is one that um, we've dealt with now for a number of years as lawyers. And if you're one of the millions of people that watch the Academy Awards this year, uh, you've dealt with it too, but not in a way that you may have realized. You may have noticed that many of the award-winning winning films this year are based on real people and real events. Argo, The Impossible, Lincoln, of course. <laughs> That's nothing new. In the past few years, as you may have noticed, The Social Network, The Titanic, The Blind Side were among the many films about real people or real events or using real people in fictional works that have won awards. And that's nothing new either. From William Shakespeare to Ernest Hemingway to Ben Affleck, I guess, works of literature are often based on real people and events or fictionalized works that come from things that the writer has experienced in his or her real life. Mark Twain is, is given credit for having said that you write what you know. So it's not a surprise that many of our famous uh, or favorite works of literature often come from things that the author either experienced or heard about from someone else. But what if the real person or their heirs could control anything that was said or written about them? What if a writer not only had to get their permission if he or she wanted to write about someone, but he had to pay everyone in the film or everyone depicted in a book who was a real person or whose lives inspired a work of fiction? How many works would we have if writers had to do that, particularly up front, when a struggling writer or a struggling playwright is trying to decide uh, what inspiration they can come by and they realize they can't write about anything that might impact a real person. Now, that may seem impossible for us to imagine, but there's a case pending right now in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that addresses this very issue. Whether the writers and filmmakers who were involved in the film, The Hurt Locker, another award-winning film, are they required to pay an army bomb technician who claims that the film was inspired by his real life and that a lot of the events in the film are actually things that happened to him? Or put another way, does he have the right to stop them from making that film, even though it's a fictional film, if it's inspired by his real life? That's what he claims. Now, there are two other cases pending in the Ninth Circuit that I want to talk a little bit about that will decide whether video games that are based on factual information about sports figures, college athletes and professional athletes, can they create simulations that let players recreate actual games or have two teams play that never would have met in real life, but that you can play against each other in these fictional games. Who has control over what you see and what you hear in books or plays or video games? There's a tension between the First Amendment and the right of publicity or misappropriation rights. What players claim are their rights of publicity and how they control the use of their names or likenesses or other attributes that we'll talk about. Now, the Ninth Circuit that we live in has been referred to by the now Chief Judge Alex Kaczynski as the Hollywood Circuit. <laughs> Somewhat true, and it's certainly true that there are more cases involving misappropriation that are heard here than anywhere else in the country. But misappropriation claims are a creature of state law, so it's not just California that has these claims, and there are widely different laws in all parts of the country. Rights of publicity aren't unique to Hollywood celebrities either. You don't have to be a celebrity to have a right of publicity, and Thanks to the mass media and reality television, anyone can be a celebrity. <laughs> so even you, if you choose to do so, can be a celebrity and, and sell your rights or bargain for your rights with a, a motion picture studio or a book, book author. But to really understand what's happening now in this area, the rights of publicity versus the First Amendment and this tension that uh, lawyers who do what I do deal with every day, you have to step back to see where it was that this claim came from. Now, all the students who have taken first-year torts, I'm sure, have heard about the legal concept of privacy that first gained privacy, that first gained prominence in 1890. Uh, it's a law review article that was written by Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis. They argued for courts to recognize a tort claim, a brand new tort claim, that would protect individuals from unwanted publication of things about their personal lives, the right to be left alone. Now, it's a little less well known that the article was actually inspired in part by one of the authors being unhappy about things that had been written about his daughter's marriage. But the article went through great lengths talking about the history in England and other countries of this recognized right of people to not be in the public eye, people to not be talked about in the newspapers. And notwithstanding this 
seminal piece of work. There were a lot of early court cases by people who were unhappy about being portrayed in one way or another, using their names and likenesses, and by and large, they were not successful. The first of these cases in 1902 involved this young woman, Abigail Roberson. She filed a lawsuit after a local milling business took a very nice photograph of her that they got from her photographer, and they put it on a flower sack. And they didn't ask her permission to do that. They thought it was a very nice photo, and they had this very nice slogan, Flower of the Family. And she sued, saying that she had not given her permission, and she wasn't very happy about the 25,000 different lithographs that they published all over town and the flower sacks that had her likeness on it. And the court said, well, it wasn't a libel claim. In fact, it was a very nice likeness of her, so they didn't really see any reason that, that she could sue for her image being hurt. And the court struggled with this because even though they weren't unsympathetic to this young woman, they said there's really no precedent for a claim based on a right not to be depicted. They said they can't really draw a distinction between this kind of publicity and her being written about in the local newspaper. And that certainly would be protected under the Constitution. So if they can't control that, they didn't see how they could control this. They read and talked about the article that was written in 1890 on privacy, and they looked at old English cases, and there's a long discussion, but they said, this is really something the state legislature needs to deal with. We have really nothing that we can do for her. Now, actually, in response to this, the New York legislature passed one of the first misappropriation statutes in the country um, because they were offended by this young woman not having any recourse. But courts, for many years, struggled with what they could do as a remedy for something like this. And some courts came to a different conclusion. Now, in Georgia, in a case involving an insurance company, they came to a different conclusion. This gentleman who is pictured here in this insurance ad as having been the smart one who bought life insurance from New England Life was unhappy because, in fact, he didn't buy life insurance from New England Life. <laughs> he didn't buy life insurance at all. And he really didn't like the fact that his picture was being used in this advertisement for life insurance. So he sued. And his case went up to the Georgia Supreme Court, and in a very lengthy decision, they recognized the different decision that had come out in New York, and they said, they frankly went with the, the, the Brandeis and Warren article and said there has to be a personal right of privacy that the courts recognize, that this is derived from natural law, and that gives individuals protection against the use of their images when they don't want to have publicity. They really viewed it as an adjunct of privacy in the sense that we would normally consider a privacy claim, a private fact about yourself. And even though there was nothing private about this person that was revealed, in fact, the only thing that was said about him was not true, they said that, that it had to be some kind of a claim that was an adjunct to privacy that they recognized. And this is sort of where things stood for a number of years. This was really a right to prevent your likeness from being publicized against your will. And particularly if it wasn't in connection with something newsworthy, in connection with something commercial, which was considered to be somewhat unsavory in the early 1900s. But the concept of a right of publicity as we recognize it today, essentially the right to commercially exploit your image, didn't come up until the 1950s. And when it did come up, it didn't involve a suit by an individual at all. It involved a fight between two companies who sold chewing gums. And they all like to use baseball cards and baseball players to sell chewing gum. And one of the companies had gone to great lengths to go around and pay a bunch of baseball players for the exclusive right to have their image on baseball cards sold with their chewing gum. And another company went around to the same baseball players who were more than happy to sell their rights again exclusively <laughs> to another company. So the two companies fought with each other. And the issue the court had to decide was whether the baseball players had anything to sell at all. Because if they were just selling a right, sort of waiving their right to be used, was that the same thing as selling a property right that one company could enforce against another? And the Second Circuit Court in New York, for the first time, referred to what it called a right of publicity and said that it's not just the right to be left alone, but it's the value that comes with the use of someone's image that may have some interest to the public. And so that's the right of having this exclusive privilege to use an image belonged to the baseball players and they could sell it to a company. Now having sold it once, they said they couldn't really sell it again, so the company that had the first contract won the case. One year later, in 1954, Melville Nimmer wrote an article where he talked about the distinction between the privacy kind of claims that had existed for 50 years and this commercial exploitation claim. 
which he said was completely different because the right to be left alone and to be private didn't really help celebrities. If they wanted to sell their image rights, that didn't really help them because they really were not asking to be left alone. They were just asking to be paid. So he and other commentators recognized that during this period of time, particularly in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, we, we had a start of what we might call the, the celebritization of America. Not only newspapers, but radio. People were becoming national figures. And we were all interested in every little detail about their personal lives. What kind of soap they used was something that mattered to American housewives. What kind of underwear they wore. All of those things were things that had a value now that didn't exist before because people wanted to know about it and people cared what the celebrities bought. So more and more states began passing statutes protecting these rights and more courts would recognize them. But it still took a long time before this was a widely recognized right and of course when most of these cases were coming up, they were coming up in the context of advertisements. Now there's one major exception which I'll talk about in a minute and that was a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1977, Zucchini versus Scripps Howard. That's the cannonball in the title of my presentation and I'll come back to that case. But why was the law developing in the, in the context of advertisements? Well, because even courts and legislatures who didn't always agree on what these rights should be, whether someone really had a right of privacy that would prevent you from publishing their picture, or whether they really had some other kind of right, they all agreed that to be able to use somebody's picture in an advertisement where they didn't want to be in that advertisement, or to falsely suggest that they were endorsing a product that they didn't endorse, they all seemed to agree that there was something wrong with that. And so all of these cases began coming through the courts, particularly in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, involving the use of likenesses in ads. And at the same time, the protections for the First Amendment were starting to develop. So there became more and more cases recognizing the importance of the First Amendment rights, but the advertisements were not recognized as having the same level of protection under the First Amendment as something you would read in a newspaper article or something that you would see on TV. So the combination of those two things the, the vast interest in celebrities, the recognition that there were important First Amendment rights, but those rights didn't exist in the same way for advertisements as they might exist in other kinds of expressive works. Those all led to a number of decisions coming out about celebrities having the right to control their use of likenesses in ads. So the case law started to evolve about what those rights entailed. Now what was a name or a photograph of a famous person, those were the easy cases. So if you were going to put a celebrity's name in your ad and claim that they bought your soap, then they better actually be getting money to buy the soap from you because otherwise they were going to sue you and they would win. So the advertisers got clever and so they started using lookalikes. Okay, well we won't use the real person. We're not using the image. We'll just use somebody that looks like Woody Allen. And actually there were an unbelievable number of cases involving Woody Allen in, in the 1980s. <laughs> There were five that I counted where the reported decisions, because they would find these actors who would represent Woody Allen in an ad, and the cases came down pretty consistently on the side of the celebrity, saying you can't use a look-alike and pretend it's Woody Allen. So they said, well, okay, we'll try something different. They started using sound-alikes. Now, the cases often were cases that had bad facts, and the Bette Midler case was one of these cases that had bad facts. The Ford Motor Company went to Bette Midler and they tried to get her to do an ad where she would sing in the background where they were parading around their cars and she said no. She had no interest in having her voice used in an ad. So they went and hired one of her former backup singers and had the singer imitate Bette Midler in the ad. And not surprisingly, Bette Midler took exception to that and sued. And the court didn't have really any trouble saying that that was an improper use of her voice so it conjured up Brett Midler in the same way that using a lookalike conjured up Woody Allen. But that wasn't where the court stopped. It wasn't just if they looked like you could see the, the face and it looked like the person or sounded like the person. Don Newcomb, famous picture, 1998. Now this is another case where bad facts may have influenced the result. He was an all-star baseball player. He pitched for the Brooklyn Dodgers from 1949 to 1960. And Coors Killian Red. They, want, they wanted to use sort of an iconic picture of baseball in one of their ads. And they really liked this picture of Don Newcomb. And they had a picture of him that looked just about like that from the World Series. And so they published an ad, and I actually had one of our staff find the, the original, the guys can look at this later, the original Sports Illustrated from 1998. <laughs> the original ad where they had 
You see the ad on the one side. It's not Don Newcomb. It's not his face. You can't even see the face of the, of the, the player, and it's not his number advertising this beer. And Don Newcomb was not very happy about this. Among other reasons, he had a personal, personal aversion to alcohol, and he really didn't want to be pictured in an alcohol ad. And Coors admitted that the photo was actually based on a, a photo of the drawing was based on a photo of him pitching in the World Series. But the district court dismissed the claim because it wasn't Don Newcomb in the ad. And they said, it's not you. And it's not even a face that looks like you, so there's no basis for an ad. But it went up to the Ninth Circuit. And someone in the Ninth Circuit was very clearly a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. <laughs> the opinion started like this. Newcomb is the only player in Major League history to have won the Most Valuable Player Award, the Cy Young Award, and the Rookie of the Year Award. He was a four-time member of the National League All-Star Team. He batted over 300 in four different seasons, and he had the most wins of any pitcher in the National League in 1950, 51, 55, and 56. <laughs> When that's the start of the opinion, you know bad things are going to follow. <laughs> and they did, at least for Coors. The court had no problem in the Ninth Circuit saying that this was a use of Don Newcomb's persona, of his image, even though it was a drawing based on a picture that didn't have his face in it. But that even wasn't enough. Courts started recognizing things like a sports car. Matzenbacher sued saying that that sports car was his sports car. So the use of a sports car in an ad was really essentially saying he was in the ad. And the court said, yeah, that makes sense. If it's something that you're associated with, then you should be able to sue if they use that item in their ads. Johnny Carson. <laughs> the, the very clever company had toilets, and so they started using ads saying, here's Johnny. <laughs> well, Johnny, Johnny Carson was not imp impressed by that. So he sued in 1983, and he won, because the court said that catchphrase was associated with Johnny Carson, even though it doesn't mention his last name, and he's not pictured in the ad at all. There was a, a photo of a, a, a sort of an athletic-looking African-American man no face or nothing else distinguishable, but just the phrase, the greatest. And Muhammad Ali sued. And the court said he could sue for that because the greatest in the context of an African-American man would, of course, conjure up Muhammad Ali. But we really reached the high mar water mark, <laughs> or the low water mark, depending on your point of view, in the Vanna White case in 1992. This was from a Samsung ad about what you're going to see in the future. And Samsung said, you're going to see all this great technology in the future. And they had this robot turning letters of a futuristic game show. And of course, guess who sued? Vanna White of Wheel of Fortune fame said, you know, this actually conjures up my image, so I should be able to sue for a robot with a blonde wig. And the Ninth Circuit said, yes, you can. <laughs> It's a common law misappropriation claim. They recognized that this was not Vanna White on, on the right there, the, the robot. So it's not her actual image. But they said under the common law, that evokes people, makes people think about Vanna White. And so she was allowed to sue for that. The case has become almost as well known for the, the, the dissent that was written by Alex Kaczynski when the case went up for rehearing on Bonk and the Ninth Circuit refused to hear the case on Bonk. And he wrote a decision that started as follows. Saddam Hussein wants to keep advertisers from using his picture in unflattering contexts. Clint Eastwood doesn't want tabloids to write about him. Rudolph Valentino's heirs want to control his film biography. The Girl Scouts don't want their image soiled by association with certain activities. George Lucas wants to keep strategic defense initiative fans from calling it Star Wars. PepsiCo doesn't want singers to use the word Pepsi in their songs, and so forth and so on. And he said the problem with all of that is you start carving out all these things that are no longer allowed to be said or written about or portrayed, and what's left of the First Amendment. And he urged the courts and his brethren to take a hard look at what was happening with this area of law in the advertising context, because all of a sudden you're taking away all this protected speech that, that he felt was a real significant problem. But not everyone listened to him. In, 19, in the, the 1997, we had another series of cases in the Ninth Circuit where robots on bar stools, I think the message here is don't use robots. I think that's what you can take out of these cases. Robots on bar stools in a bar called Cheers got sued by the two famous actors in Cheers, saying that these robots in bar stools look like us, even though they actually look like the characters that these gentlemen played 
in the television series. And they didn't own the television series. They didn't even own the rights to the characters. Yet, the Ninth Circuit said they can sue because by using those characters that evokes the image of those actors, those actors have a claim. That courts have taken a little bit of a step back from, which we'll talk about. But the context of all these cases more and more, even in something that is commercial, but not an advertisement, was that there's a very broad range of rights that celebrities have to protect their image. Now, curiously, this iconic photograph on Vanity Fair of Demi Moore was then the subject of a parody <laughs> by Leslie Nielsen for his movie, Demi Moore did not sue. Annie Leibovitz, the photographer who took the picture of her, did sue for copyright infringement, claiming that this was essentially a derivative work from her photograph. And the court said, no, it's a parody. It's supposed to be funny. And so you don't get a claim for copyright infringement. But I have to wonder what would have happened. Doesn't it evoke the image of Demi Moore when you see the Leslie Nielsen poster for the movie? If, under the Vanna White case, she might have been able to succeed on that claim. But then a whole other group of people wanted in on the action. I mean, it's not enough that you have all these live celebrities suing. What about dead people? I mean, dead people should be able to sue as well, right? <laughs> well, it kind of goes without saying dead people can't sue you. At least even in the United States, they can't sue you for invasion of privacy or libel or anything else. And in 1979, the California Supreme Court faced this exact claim. Whoops, I forgot the Lindsay Lohan case. Let me step back one more time. This, this was another case that was actually settled. If you, if you saw the ad for E-Trade, where the E-Trade baby that's always talking says that he you know, was very busy doing trades, so he didn't get to call his girlfriend. And she said, were you with that milkaholic Lindsay? <laughs> and Lindsay Lohan sued, saying that that conjured up the image of her. Um, the case settled, so we don't know if she would have been successful. But that, to me, was the low watermark. While he's coming, we'll talk about dead people. <laughs> In 1979, the, the heirs of Bela Lugosi sued. His widow and his son sued um, because they said that Universal Pictures, which had the rights to all of, all of the movies, Dracula and the Wolfman and so forth, were selling a whole bunch of other things, little tchotchkes with the Count Dracula pictures on them. They were selling little pencils and pencil sharpeners and so forth. And they sued saying that, well, we should have inherited whatever rights he had. He could have sued were he still alive. We should have inherited those rights, so we should be able to sue Universal Pictures. And the California Supreme Court said no. The right of publicity is more like a right of privacy, and that those things aren't descendable. You don't get to pass them along to your heirs. So they die with you. So when you're dead, those rights are also dead. And the court said that there's a really good reason for that rule. The decision to exploit the name and likeness is a personal decision. It's not at all unlikely, according to the court, that Lugosi and others in his position did not, during their respective lifetimes, exercise their right to capitalize on personalities and transfer the value into commercial ventures for reasons of taste or judgment or simply because they didn't want to be bothered with it. So the court in California said, once you're dead, that's it. Now, at the same time, the nephew of Rudolph Valentino, not to be outdone, also sued because a TV docudrama based on Valentino's life was airing on the Spelling Goldberg Productions Company, was the production company making the movie. And so the heirs, the nephew sued, saying he should have inherited the rights to Rudolph Valentino's likeness, and therefore he should be getting paid because this movie was being made about Valentino. And making the decision at the same time, the California Supreme Court didn't have trouble saying that there, there is no right that was descendable to, to the heir. So at least in California, dead meant dead. And actually, I was just going to, I won't play the video, but in the words of, uh, words of Miracle Max, Billy Crystal's character in The Princess Bride, one of the greatest all -time movies of all time, <laughs> it turned out that dead celebrities were only mostly dead. <laughs> mostly dead, meaning their relatives' claims might be partly alive. Because some states decided that misappropriation claims should be inheritable. So even though the courts hadn't recognized that they were inheritable, more and more states started passing laws to make them inheritable. And California joined that group in 1985, passing a statute called, appropriately, the Celebrities' Rights Act that allowed a deceased person's heirs to inherit the right of publicity under certain conditions. And now you have more than a dozen states across the country where misappropriation rights are descendable. And the terms of those rights, the term when the heirs can enforce those rights, ranges from 10 years on the low end among the states that recognize it to 100 years in Indiana to Tennessee, the birthplace of Elvis Presley, which has no limit on how long the rights can be enforced as long as there is a commercial interest in the rights. So 
the next question, of course, naturally arose with all the states having different laws. Whose state's law applies? Well, borrowing from law applicable to personal property, the Ninth Circuit in, in 2002, involving a case with Princess Diana, who by then was sadly had, had died, that you have to look at the place where the person was living, where they were domiciled at the time of their death. And in this particular case, the Franklin Mint made these very clever little Princess Diana dolls, and the estate of Princess Diana sued and said that they should be able to control her rights of publicity. But because the UK doesn't recognize rights of publicity, and because she was domiciled in England at the time of her death, the Ninth Circuit said there are no rights to descend because there's no recognized right in the place where she lived at the time of her death. Now, just last year, the Ninth Circuit reaffirmed the ruling in a case involving Marilyn Monroe and said that you can't sue for misappropriation under California law if you're domiciled in some in another place at the time of your death. In that particular case, again, facts always matter. The courts were probably influenced by the fact that when Monroe actually died, her estate claimed that she was a domiciliary of New York because they didn't want to pay California taxes. So when this issue came up about her, her estate suing for rights of publicity and they tried to say, oh, but no, she really she had a house in California, she loved California, the courts weren't really sympathetic because they had already said that she was a domiciliary of New York. But now this issue has come up in a case in Los Angeles that our firm is involved in, so I don't pretend to be um, unbiased about it, involving People Magazine and the Albert Einstein estate. The Hebrew University, uh, uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem has sued General Motors involving an ad published in People Magazine in 2009. Now, for many years, the Hebrew University has claimed that it owns the rights to Albert Einstein's image and name, that it inherited those rights, even though his will doesn't say anything about rights of publicity or misappropriation, but it does give the literary rights to HUJ. It says that as a result of that, it owns the rights to anything you want to publish about Albert Einstein. And it's filed a number of lawsuits over the years. A lot of the cases have been um, amicably resolved, so we don't know what the courts would have said about it, but in this particular case, the Sexiest Man Alive issue, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is the Sexiest Man Alive in 2009, the readers of the magazine would have gone past the cover photo, opened it up to see this. <laughs> Seemed pretty funny to you know General Motors, because then the next page was, of course, the General Motors ad for its sexy car. But, even though General Motors thought this was funny, Hebrew University did not. They thought it was a violation of their rights to the Einstein image, and they sued in Los Angeles, asserting claims under California's misappropriation statute, under New Jersey's law because uh, Albert Einstein died in New Jersey, and under a whole bunch of other things. Now, the federal district judge, Howard Match, dismissed the Lanham Act claim on summary judgment in 2012, saying that no reasonable person would think that <laughs> Albert Einstein was really endorsing this car, so he had no trouble throwing out the Lanham Act claim. And he threw out the California claims because Einstein, whoops, Einstein died in New Jersey. So it would have been under New Jersey law, not California law, so they can't sue under California law. And New Jersey doesn't have a statute recognizing dead people's rights to sue or their heirs' rights to sue for misappropriation. But the question was, is there a common law right of publicity under New Jersey law that would have been recognized? And Judge Matz was put in the position of trying to decide what would New Jersey say, because New Jersey hasn't decided that issue. And as the case approached the trial date, Judge Matz said, well, he thought that New Jersey would actually recognize the rights of dead people to sue. And the question being, how long do those rights last? Because there's no statute. And as I said, the statutes are all over the map, from 10 years to 100 years to forever. How long can the heirs sue under common law rights of publicity for a dead person? Now, General Motors argued that even if HUJ had the rights, Einstein died 54 years before this ad was published. And most of the states have statutes that don't extend past 50 years, so the rights should be gone. HUJ asked the court to find that, like copyright law, um, it's at least 70 years, and every time Mickey Mouse gets close to that, they extend it, so it should actually go on forever, or it should be forever, like states like Tennessee recognize. But Judge Matt disagreed, and he said that, and I, what I think is a very, uh, it's a very interesting and I think compelling decision, not because we won, but, but it's actually worth a read, um, but very interesting where he talks about the reasons why there has to be some limit 
under the First Amendment and set some limit under just rational advertising law for saying that at some point the heirs shouldn't be able to sue anymore. And so he looked at all the state statutes and he looked at all these different things like copyright law and said 50 years is long enough that most of the states don't allow it to go past 50 years. So he didn't think in a common law context it should be more than 50 years. So he threw out the case and it's now pending in the Ninth Circuit. So between 1902 and now, the rights of celebrities to sue for misappropriation have expanded dramatically and takes us all the way back to what you do in expressive works, and that's Zucchini. A very unusual case involving a human cannonball, 15 <laughs> second performance of this guy. That's what he did. He went to county fairs, he got shot out of a cannon, and for 15 seconds, that was his act. And a local radio and television guy videotaped it and put it on the evening news in 1972. And Zucchini was crushed because he said, no one's going to come watch my act because you just put it on television. They can just watch TV. It didn't fit into any of the neat boxes that all these other cases fit into because it wasn't an ad. It was actually on a news program. And it wasn't libelous, so it didn't fit into those boxes. And it wasn't an invasion of his privacy. He wanted people to come see him do this. So it wasn't as if he was trying to not be a public person. And the lower courts had a real hard time deciding whether he had any rights at all. And if he did, what would those rights be? So the Court of Appeal reversed the trial court, which had found that there were no rights, and said that it agreed that there weren't any privacy rights, but it thought that there was some kind of a common law conversion right or a common law copyright that would give him a claim. And the Ohio Supreme Court said, well, no, it didn't think that either one of those really fit either, but that there had to be some kind of a claim unless it's a matter of legitimate public interest. And here, it was a legitimate public interest, so they really saw no way to help Mr. Zucchini. Now, not surprisingly, the briefs that, that he filed, his lawyers filed in the Supreme Court, were all about the fact that his entire performance, the whole 15 seconds, was on the news. It must have been said in the brief that I read at least 15 times, the reference to entire performance. And the US Supreme Court, five to four, had a problem with that, because they said that's, that's very unique. If you use the entire performance, that's different than a newscast talking about it. That's different than even showing the guy's picture in a news context. That's really stopping him from being able to make a living as an entertainer. And so they said, when you get to that point, there has to be a right that's recognized that the First Amendment doesn't protect. And they allowed his claim to go forward. So plaintiffs started citing this case for right of publicity rights, saying, oh, OK, the First Amendment doesn't stop you from suing for right of publicity. That wasn't completely right. The defendants would say, well, but this is, this is like an ad case. But that wasn't completely right either. So by and large, you had a lot of cases trying to decide where the lines were on right of publicity after Zucchini, which is the only US Supreme Court case on these issues at all. So the California Supreme Court, in the Guglielmi case I mentioned, involving Rudolph Valentino, two years after the Zucchini case, said, it's a First Amendment right. You can't stop the guy from making a film about Rudolph Valentino. And a couple years after that, in a case called Polly Doris, the Court of Appeal in California said, even if it's a completely fictional work, and you copy the look and the attributes of someone you grew up with to put, make this fictional film, The Sandlot, that's OK, because the First Amendment protects that. But then we got this case. Now, the tests seem to always mirror something bad that's happening in the facts. And in, in 2001, a case that went up to the California Supreme Court, another bad facts case, the court was faced with this. Lithographs and t-shirts with the pictures of the Three Stooges on it. And the Three Stooges company, their heirs, were not so happy about this. And the California Supreme Court really had to struggle because t-shirts don't sound like they're too expressive or should be protected. But lithographs, maybe they should be protected. And they said, well, those, those are expressive works, but they clearly didn't like what was going on. And so they came up with a new test, what they called the transformative use test. And they said, if you're really just using the celebrity image, then that's not protected under the Constitution. If the, the image is something that is just the raw materials that you're using to make something else, well, then the Constitution protects it. So here's a picture of the Three Stooges. Here's the portraits. Huh doesn't really look to me like those are the same, but that's what the California Supreme Court said. So they said the test allowed the, the claim to go forward. Well, the lower courts had problems with that. Among other things, the court said, this is OK. 
They said in particular, using this example of Andy Warhol, but it's different because this is art, right? So Andy Warhol doing this, using this image, that's okay, but this is not okay. So you can see why the lower courts had some trouble. So then we get to this. These comic books, really lovely comic books, where they were making fun of a whole variety of people, including these two singer-songwriters, the Winter Brothers. And the Winter Brothers weren't happy about their images being in this comic book as half-worm creatures <laughs> that lived underground. And so they sued for misappropriation. And they said, they're just using our image, and there's no protection for this kind of stuff. And the lower court agreed with them. The Court of Appeals said, yeah, they're just using the, the images of the Winter Brothers, and that's not allowed. And it went back up to the California Supreme Court, and the California Supreme Court said, this isn't a hard case at all. This is protected under the First Amendment. And they said that it wasn't a hard case, but they reversed a Court of Appeal that unanimously said that this was an infringement of the Winter Brothers' right of publicity. And in the nine years since this case, we've had cases all over the map as to how you apply these rules. So you have one case where the use of, in her mind, the singer's image in a video game was not okay. Or was it was okay, you could do that. And then another use of a singer's image in a video game was found to be an infringement that could go forward. Paris Hilton using her picture on a greeting card, not transformative, even though somebody's drawn a little picture around it. But that's somehow not as transformative as Andy Warhol drawing a picture of Marilyn Monroe. You have this use of Dustin Hoffman's picture in a magazine article that talked about different kinds of fashion. And the court said, you know, that seems like a First Amendment protected use. But then, a couple years later, you've got a catalog from Abercrombie & Fitch that has all these articles about athletes and what they're doing. And the court said, that's not OK. That's not a transformative use. You have <laughs> these gentlemen. Tony Twist, who's a hockey player, claiming that this Tony Twist from DC Comics was infringing on his rights of publicity. And the Missouri Supreme Court said, yes, it is. And they applied an entirely different case, saying, well, it's predominantly about Tony Twist. And so if the predominant use is the celebrity's image, then the celebrity can sue you and get all of your profits. But how is that different from the Winter Brothers, who were certainly predominantly, if you read this entire comic cover to cover, as I did, they're predominantly <laughs> the focus of this comic book. But the California Supreme Court said that that's OK. So what tests do you apply? In a different context, the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit and other circuits have applied a test that is called the Ginger Rogers test or Rogers versus Grimaldi test because of this poster in this movie called Ginger and Fred. Ginger and Fred was not about Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. It was a fictional movie about these dancers who liked to sort of hold themselves as being like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. And the real Ginger Rogers didn't like that, and she sued. And the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit, the Second Circuit heard this case. The Ninth Circuit since adopted the same test, saying that if you're using a celebrity's name or likeness or something about them, and it really does relate in some way, no matter how small it relates to the First Amendment protected work, that you cannot sue for that as the celebrity unless there is some kind of expressly misleading statement about you endorsing that work. There wasn't here, so Ginger Rogers lost. And in the subsequent cases in the Ninth Circuit, the plaintiffs have lost. So what do you do in the cases we now have pending in the Ninth Circuit? We have a poster case involving Joe Montana, where Joe Montana lost because that was a First Amendment protected work. We have Carol Burnett losing because the use of this character in a cartoon was found to be protected. And now you've got college athletes and professional athletes suing, claiming that the use of images and statistical information about them in video games is an infringement on their, constitute, on their rights of publicity. So what do you do with these cases? Now, there's no question that video games are protected works under the First Amendment. That's now been decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in the context of violent video games uh, in the Brown versus Electronic Merchants case in 2001. So that's been laid to rest. So you don't have this debate about whether they're protected, but how do you deal with the use of what is really statistical information about players? Now, if you haven't ever played these games, and I, I admit freely I had not until we got hired to represent Electronic Arts in these, in these cases, 
it's a fairly detailed depiction of professional football in one game and college sports in the other games. You've got stadiums and fans and commentators, and you play the game. You pick the teams. You can actually recruit your own players to the teams if you want. You can change the way the players look. If you don't like your players' hair color, you can make them blonde instead of brown haired. You can make them bulkier. You can, in college games, use the mascots and change the heads on the players. That's my favorite part. So you can have the Trojans with the Trojan head and the little feather thing. You can have them playing the bears. And so you've got like bears running down the field. So it's actually pretty creative. But the athletes are not happy because they're not getting paid. So. When you play these games, you use statistics from real athletes, and they say that's their persona, much like Vanna White claimed in the Vanna White case, the computer robot was her persona. So we have two cases now pending in the Ninth Circuit, one involving Jim Brown, who sued down here in Los Angeles, and my firm handled that case in front of Judge Florence Marie Cooper. And Judge Cooper threw the case out and said the First Amendment protects this kind of work. Then you've got a case involving college athletes up in Northern California, where the district judge came to the precise opposite conclusion in a misappropriation case, saying that the use of these players is not transformative because you're using their actual likenesses. And if you're not transforming them from the setting that they're in, that it's not within the test that the California Supreme Court set out in, in Winter Brothers and in the Comedy 3 case. So now we have both cases in the Ninth Circuit. And the question the Ninth Circuit is going to have to decide is what test are they going to apply so these two cases that raise essentially the same claim, but in slightly different contexts. One argument has been on our side that they should use the Rogers test, the most more protective First Amendment test, because if you don't do that, now that we have a, a ruling from the Supreme Court that says video games are just like movies, they're just like books, if you say you can't use likenesses or information about real people in those, where does that leave you in the context of the law of movies and books? Does that mean you can't do a documentary about football players? Does that mean you can't make a movie like The Blind Side, which was about a real football player because you're actually using information about him? Or you can't use status pro baseball statistics to play your own game, which the courts had said previously was OK. So those cases have been argued now twice. Um, argued for the first time, I argued in February of 2011. Uh, sadly, six months later, Judge Reimer, uh, one of our panelists, died. And so they had a second argument last July, July of 2012, with, with a, a two of the same judges and a third judge who replaced Judge Reimer. And we wait. Uh, we don't know what the Ninth Circuit is going to do with those cases. Um, but where we have this disconnect in the third case, that's now been argued in the Third Circuit, by the way, involving the same essentially kind of claims. That was argued in September by one of my partners. And we're waiting. I won't uh, take up the time to try to play some of these videos. but. The, the case that now sits involving these two cases, we have to decide what test is going to be applied. And in the meantime, you've got this case involving the Hurt Locker, where using the district court decision in the Keller case involving football players, Mr. Sarver has claimed you're not transforming anything by, by this film because you're using all these details about my real life and you're just having an actor play me instead of it actually being me. And he claims that's not transformative and he should be able to get money from the movie. In the next few years, we're going to have a lot of things that are going to come up that are going to be different because of how the technology is changing the way we look at expressive works, the way we look at movies and books and all kinds of things. Um, you now have, in, in 2004, the ability to take an actual actor who died before the film was completed and do scenes using that actor as if he actually acted in those scenes when he didn't. You now have things like this, Avatar, where you take real actors but you make avatars out of them. And those actors, if you use this image on the left, the blue guy, does that mean the actor gets to sue because the image was really taken from his acting in the movie? Or even more to the point, Lord of the Rings, where you use a computer-generated actor, this, this thing on the left, based on the actual actor's performance. But the computer-generated thing obviously doesn't look anything like the real actor. But yet, who, whose rights are they when you talk about those characters? Now, I don't know if, if any of you saw the um, Tupac Shakur performance um, that happened in Coachella, but they took uh, a simulation which actually looked like Tupac Shakur by using these different kinds of images and the way the technology can now work, 
it actually looks like him standing up there singing and playing. Does that mean that, assuming that, that you could do those things, that you can now simulate actors? Now, both of the panels in the Ninth Circuit and the two video game cases, both of the panels asked me this question. What, what does this mean if you can use an image in a movie? Does that mean you could take an avatar that looks just like Tom Cruise, just like they did of Tupac Shakur, and it, this one they actually had the permission of the family, but suppose they didn't. Can you take Tom Cruise, make an avatar, and do another Top Gun movie just as if he's performing in it, but you don't have to pay Tom Cruise, so it's a lot cheaper. And it, does that then become zucchini? Are you then at the point where you're actually interfering with the entire livelihood of an actor because you can make an image that looks just like that actor and put it in a feature film? On the flip side, if you let actors control what you can put in a, a motion picture or real people control whether you can talk about events that actually happened, then do we not have Saving Private Ryan? We don't have The Hurt Locker. We don't have The Help which was based on a young woman's real experiences in the South. You might not have Citizen Kane, because if you had to actually get permission uh, from William Randolph Hearst, that film never would have happened. <laughs> no way. And James Cameron probably would have skipped the Titanic, because there's no way he could have gotten the heirs of all the people who actually died on the Titanic and the few that survived to actually give him permission uh, it would have been in incredibly expensive if he had to pay them all to do that film. So the film would never get made. Um, as I said, the Ninth Circuit will be deciding all these things, and the technology continues to evolve. Um, so stay tuned. And I'm happy to answer two questions. We're pretty close to time, but I think I have about five minutes if anybody has any questions or comments. Or you want to look at the Sports Illustrated? <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, I don't know if uh, your client has heard about, or the Hebrew Union has heard about this, but Caltech apparently has not heard about Hebrew Union's exclusive rights. They have an Albert Einstein balcony there, and you can rent a room in the faculty club and have the Albert Einstein faculty, which, a balcony, which I guess would be some sort of commercial use. The case comes back and we call you as a witness. <laughs> One of the interesting things that came out in that case actually is um, there's an issue about whether the heirs have a right to exploit uh, a dead person's uh, right of publicity if the dead person didn't exploit it during his or her lifetime. And some states have said that if the celebrity didn't exploit those rights, then they cease to exist. So the heirs can't then choose to exploit them. Uh, Judge Matz decided that they actually could. Uh, we had, there was an issue about whether Einstein ever exploited his rights during his lifetime. He, didn't, he wasn't hawking cars or, or you know, selling groceries with his image. And, and Judge Matt said he thought that New Jersey would allow the claim to go forward on that grounds and threw it out for other reasons. It's a very interesting issue. I saw hands up here somewhere. Yes? So I think right, you've made a completely persuasive case about the detriment, the, the threat the right of publicity poses to expressive words. I, I wonder what your thoughts are about the threat that the right of publicity poses to advertising, to the kind of core aspect, because it does seem to me if we move away from the 1902 picture on the flower bag to the advertising industry today, it's a little weird to think of advertising itself as not being an expressive industry right. and not being deserving of some kind of First Amendment protection. And so I wonder whether or not many of the same arguments you're making about what we might more traditionally think of as expressive works like movies and TV shows and plays and books might not also apply to advertising in a way that would keep the right of publicity from maybe diminishing the, the creative possibilities for advertising. It's a really good question because certainly since since uh, you know the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, there have become more recognition that, that advertisements are protected speech just like other speech is protected speech. They're just protected at a lower level. So Virginia Board of, Board of Pharmacy and other cases have said there's a right to receive information in advertisements and there's a right of advertisers to get their message across that's also protected by the First Amendment. Where I think the courts have said that it's okay to find liability is really more of, of like a false endorsement or misleading or false advertising claim where you're pretending that the celebrity is endorsing a product that he or she isn't endorsing at all, that that's where I think the courts have no trouble finding that the laws can support liability. I think it's a harder case if you're using something that may look like an advertisement that's completely honest. 
And if you're saying that somebody is using a product, you know, <laughs> that they're actually using, and you use that in some kind of a, an advertisement or promotional aspect, to me, that's a much harder case under the First Amendment. And it's interesting to note that a lot of other countries don't recognize these rights at all. If there is a, a true false uh, statement or false advertising com component to it, they might address that under some kind of a passing off claim. But otherwise, um, a, a good example that, that my husband and I sort of had a laugh about, you know, remember when Hugh Grant sort of had his problem with the prostitute, Divine Brown? Um, he was later pictured coming out of a, of a stationery store, a Ryman stationery store in London, carrying a Ryman's bag. And they ran an ad with him carrying this bag and said, Hugh Grant wouldn't pick up just any old bag. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't sue. <laughs> now, whether he could have sued in the United States or not, he, he couldn't sue in London, or at least felt he couldn't sue. And, and that kind of use is, is, you know, often you see those in advertisements. We actually had one client who was a clothing manufacturer who does ads where they capture people who are just walking down the street wearing this particular item of clothing and they put them in the ads without the people pay, getting paid anything or their permission. And he said, we can do that in the U.S., right? I said, uh, I wouldn't probably do that in the U.S. under the current state of the law. Um, but it, it raises an interesting question. Why not? Because it's truthful and, and uh, even though it's promotional, it should be protected too. Other questions? Yes? Does any of this relate to the Google Maps? It, well, it does in the sense that it, it sort of evolved from the idea of privacy, um, but there, it's a really a different branch of the privacy toward. So the, the recognition has been that there are really four different kinds of privacy, and one of them is the protection of your private information, and this one is, is, is a different context. Now, the fact that Google makes money, if it does make money, on Google Maps, the courts pretty consistently have said, just because somebody makes money on it doesn't make it an advertisement or a commercial use that's prohibited because otherwise you'd never have books or motion pictures or newspapers because they all at least hopefully <laughs> make money. I'm just reading to Carleen Goller because I know the newspapers don't make as much money as we would like them to make. So buy those newspapers. Um, but they are commercial enterprises. But the courts have said that doesn't make them commercial. Anything else? Yes? So where would you draw the line for <coughs> George Wendt, the Shears actor? Um, as an actor, I mean, what they do is they, they self-promote. That image then becomes bank line. And George Wendt and the other actor, they made money on those, character, those characters for years. Where should the line be in that case? I think the court was wrong. I, I think they came to the wrong decision. That if, if you own the copyright to that character, that's a different animal, and there you may have a right that you can protect. So Paramount, who owned the rights to the characters, if they hadn't hadn't gotten permit, given permission for those those uses in the bars, I think they would have had a copyright claim. But I don't think that the actor gets to use their, their supposed persona to stop somebody from using the rights to the character, even though they were that character. I mean, we've had how many James Bonds now? <laughs> and, you know, the first few all kind of looked, you know, they were very similar. So you've got the, you know, the British strapping guy, and then you've got another British strapping guy. And it's okay to hire an actor that looks similar, and they don't own that character. And I just think the court got it wrong because they were sympathetic. And, and that's one of those where, where I think the bad facts kind of made bad law. And interestingly, it actually came up twice. The first time, the district court threw it out after looking at pictures. Because, you know, you file motions, so you've got pictures of the actor, pictures of, the, of these, you know, dummies. And the Ninth Circuit said, that's not good enough. The district court erred by not looking at the actual people and the actual dummies. So they had to bring the guys in, and they brought the dummies in. And the court looked at him again and said, you still lose. And then it went back up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit reversed. So they, I think the district court was correct. There's a reception in the courtyard. Please join us for that. Please again thank Kelly Sager for her wonderful lecture.